Welcome to the Live Full Work Fun Podcast. This is the show to encourage you to live your life to the fullest and do fun work that fuels your lifestyle. Hi, I'm your host, Gayla Scrivener. Every week, you'll be introduced to amazing guests, useful resources, and inspirational stories. You'll discover opportunities and perspectives to shape your version of living full and working fun. Well, hi there, and welcome to the show. If this is your first time here, I'm glad you're joining me. Thanks for checking out the show. And if you're returning, welcome back. It's always great to have you here. Are you a part of the Live Full Work Fun community yet? Well, if not, hop over to Facebook and join the Live Full Work Fun Facebook group. And don't be shy to hop in there and make some comments and introduce yourself. Let's get some conversations started revolving around what makes a full life and fun work. Well, there are so many dimensions about life that make up living full. There's family, there's friends, home, hobbies, work, interests, health. You know, none of us are one dimensional. We have so many things about us that make us interesting. We all have different things in our lives that spark our interest and brings joy. But a lot of times, there are certain pockets of people who see us only in one way. And there's nothing bad about that, but it's interesting when you discover different things. And it's not until you get to know someone a bit better that you discover that there may be other common interests or experiences that spark even more of a connection, a deeper connection. Today's guest is someone who I've been following for a while now through a different aspect of my and Robert's life. For me, it's more of a hobby and a getaway from modern day technology. For Robert, it's more. It's an interest that sparks his artistic creativity through leatherwork. This aspect of our lives that I'm talking about has to do with black powder shooting. Yeah. There is a whole community revolving around muzzle-loading black powder shooting that, truth be told, I would have never, ever known about without Robert. And for his love of history of the mountain man fur trade era that primarily ran through about the 1820s to the 1840s. Over the last few years, Robert has gotten more and more involved in different activities through muzzle-loading. From going to trade shows, rendezvous, dressing up in period clothing, and creating and selling his leather goods that fit with the fur trade era. Now, I go to many of these events over the years. Robert has nudged me to get even more involved, and I'm dressing in period clothing now when we go to some of these events. And through this muzzle-loading community, I've met some amazing people and see how they weave their love of their hobby into working at something that is fun for them, often incorporating their work skills into earning a great living through their hobby. There is this great YouTube channel called I Love Muzzle Loading. And through Robert beginning to watch it and subscribe to the channel, oh gosh, a while back, I end up catching episodes because, you know, after all, Robert and I are together most of the time and what he watches, I watches. So we watch the same things. Well, anyway, through watching the show, I became really interested in the content and felt like I was getting to know the host. I recognize how much work really goes into producing a YouTube channel, and he does a fantastic job. I love how he's using his love of muzzle loading to make his life full, and the work involved in producing that show is fun for him. And as I found out through talking with him more, I found out that he's also a content marketer in his day job. I see how his skills cross over in both his hobby and work life and to use what he learns in both areas to enhance each other. I'm excited that Ethan Yazel, host of I Love Mosa Loading, is today's guest. Whether you're into this type of hobby or not, I think you're really going to enjoy meeting Ethan. 
Listening to his story and enthusiasm for what he loves is inspiring. Ethan is a fifth generation muzzleloading enthusiast. His family's love of muzzleloading dates back to the 1930s. He's always had a passion for history and thinks it's important to archive the stories of today's muzzleloaders for future generations. You're in for a real treat meeting Ethan today. Producing a YouTube channel is hard, and he does it out of the love for his hobby. Can he monetize it? Well, maybe. But the important thing is that he's doing it because of his love and his interest in muzzleloading. That's what makes the work of producing the show for him more fun. He also produces a podcast. I Love Muzzleloading podcast interviews contemporary artisans, historians, builders, marksmen, and industry representatives to provide unbiased news and archive personal stories for future generations. Producing just those two shows alone would seem like a full-time job, and he does it on the side of his day job. Well, let's get started in seeing just how Ethan Yazel lives full and works fun. Ethan, welcome to the show. I appreciate you coming here. I've been looking forward to this conversation for many weeks now. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to chat with you. I know you through the Mesoloading community, through my husband, because he subscribes to your channel. You have a YouTube channel called I Love Mesoloading. Why start a YouTube channel? I Love Mesoloading really started uh, because, kind of silly, but I love muzzleloading. My families, both on my mother's and my father's side, went back and, and were shooting muzzleloaders. I've been involved with shooting muzzleloaders my whole life because my, my folks were uh, shooting before I was born. My maternal grandfather goes back to the late 1930s uh, when his family got started in muzzleloading. And then just kind of through life, my folks met at a muzzleloading match. And then I really don't know a life without muzzleloading. I started shooting uh, competitively in kind of the junior matches when I was very young, starting at about the age, age of five, and then uh, kind of shot through middle school and high school, uh, got out of it a little bit through college, and then returned after college. And kind of in my, both of my grandfather's later years in life, we talked about it very fondly together, uh, kind of in those, in those last few weeks that you have with somebody before you lose them. And and that kind of ignited that back in me. I kind of you know, really wanted to connect with it more and connect with the people like they had. I mean, that was kind of their friend group and, and their community, really, you know, in a pre-internet age, it's something that we don't really see a lot of now. And just kind of lit a spark for me, really, to, to get back involved and and, uh, and start the channel and, and start the website. Kind of long-winded, but... <laughs> oh, no, no. Can you explain a little bit what the muzzle loading community is like? So a, a muzzle loader is a, a firearm. It's really now considered an antique firearm in many respects. Most often people think of the American Civil War uh, with muskets, if you've ever seen any of the Civil War movies, or like uh, American Revolution movies or films where you, everybody is loading a, a very long rifle compared to what we think of today. And you're, you're loading it with a ramrod, a single shot at a time from the muzzle. So you don't really take a lot of fast shots. Um, it's, it's real slow, but and that's really been around for nearly a thousand years now, if not a little bit more, when we look at uh, kind of human history with that, but it never really went away. So there's a, a group of us out there that love this antique, I guess this antique technology really of, of an antique arm, and, as well as the equipment and the stories and the history that goes along with it. You know, to describe the Muslim community is really hard because it's been around so long and it continues today. There's a lot of different niches that people get involved in and get interested in. So for me, I, I live in Indiana. I'm very much in tune or, or more interested with kind of the early American side of muzzleloading when Europeans were still working their way across the continent. So really early 1700s to about mid 1800s is, is really my area of interest uh, and really all aspects of it from the from the firearms themselves to the accoutrements, which is just the equipment that goes with it, as well as the history that goes along with it. But there are folks that are interested in earlier forms of muzzleloading and even later forms of muzzleloading. Each aspect really connects with a certain part of history wherever you're at in the world, because everybody used muzzleloaders at one time. So if you're over in Europe or you're over in Southeast Asia, everybody has a muzzleloader. 
the muzzleloading community really goes around the world and is very different around the world depending on how cultures developed and worked with muzzleloaders and the equipment as tools. And then you get into kind of contemporary or modern practice with it, where a very large section of the community uses it, you know, during a, a, t- a typical hunting season, usually in the in the fall and the winter, where you're connecting with kind of your ancestral family, where everybody was kind of out on the frontier, you know, taking some some game to help keep their family through the winter. So there's a there's a lot to the a lot to the muzzleloading community. <laughs> There really is, and the history that goes along with it. Uh, There's clubs. Are there like shooting clubs that people get together? There's events. How do people connect with the community for muzzleloading? Right now, I think we're at a really special time because regardless of the location that you're in, where you're at, like I said, around the world or, or just in the United States here, you can connect with the community online. So many of us now interact and, and share what we know and love about it every day, which is really exciting. But I think on a more personal level, you have a variety of muzzleloading clubs and groups really all over the United States where people have kept this tradition going locally. And that really goes back to the early 1900s, the 1920s and 1930s. You actually had an entire subsection of people really during the Great Depression that, A, used their muzzleloaders to help feed their family, you know, through the Depression, especially when you look at the southern United States into the into the mountainous regions there. And then you also had really birthed out of that era, the section that my, my one grandfather participated in where you had shooting matches, where you would have people bring in really just food was your prize and your best shot. You could take home a ham or some bacon or, you know, a large chunk of cow. And just like our forefathers, you were, you know, testing your metal and how good of a shot you were to help feed your family through a difficult time. And that tradition from the early 1900s of those shooting clubs continues through to today. And a lot of those clubs still exist and still you know, our, that same club, uh, unfortunately, with less and less of the original founding members from that era. Locally, in a lot of parts of the country, you can go to your local muzzleloading club uh, a few times a month on the weekend and, and have a shoot and share a meal with somebody or, or camp out under the stars. And then graduating out of that, you have several national organizations um, that really spurred up during the height of that as you come into um, the late 1930s, or really the early 1930s with the National Muzzleloading Rifle Association, or the NMLRA, uh, which started in 1933. That was, I think, it, to my knowledge, the first national muzzleloading association. I have not seen any documentation of an earlier one, at least formally, for that time. And that association still exists today with two national competitions and gatherings each year where black powder and muzzleloading enthusiasts come together to, to shop, you know, talk, to hang out, to camp together, and then shoot competitively, uh, just as the clubs did in the early 1900s, where you're, you're shooting for precision with a, you know firearms technology that's at least 100, 150 years old. So just like the community itself, you have a, a wide range of, of interests in those clubs from your local county club uh, with a few folks interested in muzzleloaders to a national organization like the NMLRA. There's also the Contemporary Long Rifle Association, which is more focused on the art of the long rifle and, and of the muzzleloader in general, as well as the accoutrements and just, just the normal art of the time period that muzzleloaders were really popular and really were the main, uh, the main firearms technology. And then you have coming kind of all spawned off of different uh, points in history, I think, is the theme here. And and just as I said, in the community, there are multiple avenues for people to be interested. These organizations kind of spawned off of those interests. So uh, coming off of the Civil War and interest in Civil War history here in the United States, you have the North-South Skirmish Association, which has its own black powder and and muzzleloading um, shooting competitions birthed out of the arms of the mid to late 1800s. And then you also have kind of in the same vein as the as the CLA, you have an organization like the Honorable Company of Horners, which is working to preserve uh, traditional horn work, be that powder horns or horn utensils or horn utilities, uh, where they see horn as the as the plastic of the age. And you have a whole group of people interested in in muzzleloading and and early traditional craft 
um, but they can be as specific as a as a single kind of medium, so to speak. So there's a lot to there's a lot to unpack, but I like to tell people that there's something for everybody in muzzleloading, which is hard to say about other interests or hobbies. I think. I truly enjoy it. I've been excited about being introduced to the community and have a blast at every, I guess that's pun intended, but a blast at every (laughs) event that uh, I go to with Robert. And I know that he is much more he studies the history much more than I do. I'm kind of along for the ride and the enjoyment of meeting so many fantastic people just like yourself and the artwork. I'm just blown away at so much art that goes into first making a gun. I've never thought I would uh, meet so many talented people that actually like make a gun, they forge things, they make knives, they make bags. I mean, the art in it is fascinating. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that makes it so approachable uh, because everybody can appreciate art in different kinds of art. And there's so much art, I think, you know, for many of us, when we go through school or, or just as a culture, we have an understanding of art from different time periods. But kind of honing in uh, in the Muslim community is able to, to really focus on in so much detail the art of earlier people, whether that's in the United States or anywhere, really, because it's all evidence. You know, we have all these original pieces in, in museums and things, and, and we can use that to inspire, you know, contemporary and modern artists to create things that are in the same vein, but also, you know, kind of refreshing some of those few hundred year old uh, ideas and, and compositions and however you want to think about it. It's, it's a, a really neat way to connect with history and, and the art side of it just makes it all the more appealing, I think. Well, how long have you been doing your YouTube channel? This channel specifically, I'm coming up on on just about a year, I will say, yeah. And how about your podcast? You also have a podcast, right? Yeah, and that's been running for just about the same amount of time. I think I I recorded the first episode for that about a year ago, coming up here in, in May, I think, and that went live in June. I know from experience how much time and effort it takes just to produce a podcast and then video. And what keeps you going producing such wonderful shows? Before before you answer that, it's like, I really like your YouTube channel. I like it's it, I go to it for news. I look forward to your episodes because there was a black powder. Well, what do you call it? Not not a black powder scare, but you know, there was the, the company yeah, that the- was producing the black powder. There was a change in that industry. And I looked to your channel for that news. And then there was an update about it uh, recently. So I think it's fantastic that you can be a news source for the community. But I know it takes a lot of time and effort to produce a show. So what keeps you going? I think uh, at the the most basic I can put it is I, I just love muzzleloading. And I, I love the community. Having grown up in it, I've been through not a lot you know, but at, uh, I'm just 28 years old. So I've seen, you know, 20 years of it. I've, I've, I will say I've been kind of aware of it in some capacity, much more so recently in in my adulthood. But I I think to to think about it even more and like you bring up the news, which is really all happened kind of by accident. Uh, I never really considered that uh, at least consciously as something that I could do or or even should do really to think I had any authority on it kind of felt weird, but nobody else was really talking about it. And as you can imagine in a community where we all love old things, we have a tendency to kind of, I think, not adopt new technologies like the internet. I think what we're seeing now in muzzleloading in the community is really wonderful. Um, And I think it's going through some great growth right now. You look at other hobbies or communities and things, and and they've experienced that growth maybe even 10 years ago as social media and and the internet really opened up, I think, in a widespread. And I've always been interested in cameras, kind of have a family history there with cameras and things as well. And so the YouTube channel really came out of wanting to show people what was cool about muzzleloading and, and why I enjoyed it. And I thought that maybe the enthusiasm I had for it would would help show other people what it was and and what it could be for them as well. To try to get some more folks interested in the hobby for a long time, there's been a lot of concerns about the demographics of the community. I kind of thought if I want to see this continue, that I can talk to my grandkids about it 
it, it would be better for me to try to do something and try to get the word out and get some more people interested in it than it would be to, you know, not do anything about it. And I thought if I, if I put some skin in the game, I could do something to give back and, and try to help the community that in large parts raised me, uh, spent a lot of time at, at matches and events and wanted to give back. And what I found as I started kind of looking at all of this, I'm not like a mathematician or anything, but I, I really enjoy studying business and industries and kind of the numbers and things behind that and how that relates to the internet. And I noticed that nobody was talking about the muzzleloading industry, even the, the industry itself, the companies that are in it, they don't, it's, it's usually a, a subsection of their business. It's not the largest subsection. And, you know, and that's understandable. That's business. But people weren't talking about it, about updates that were happening, what was coming out, what events were going on. And I have to, I don't know for sure, but I have to imagine it's kind of a lull in, in what I was working on or I needed a break on something. And so I just gathered up some of the muzzleloading news as I saw it for the time and, uh, and made a short video talking, you know, for a minute or a minute and a half about each topic and trying to tell people about things that were going on and events that were happening. Because a lot of times I see things online, people don't know what's going on or, or where events are at, or there's a lot of speculation about the industry. And which I understand and I don't begrudge anybody there, but it's kind of morphed into, for me, trying to shed more light on what's actually going on and talking to people from the companies that support what we're doing down to the individual artists and craftspeople that make beautiful artwork for us to see and share before you had to try to publish a book or get uh, get a section of, of being published in a, in a book to tell your story. And, you know, I, I kind of shudder to think about how many people we don't really know about because there was never a book published about them. I mean, and the expense to go through that was so incredible. And I thought if I could talk to people, you know, just for an hour at a time and, and hear about them and their process, that that would kind of, you know, help them be remembered in, in many ways. Like, uh, like I saw my grandfather, I, I recorded a lot of our, our late conversations before they, before my, my, my maternal grandfather passed, you know, being able to, to try to help out with recording more of those stories and those people so they can't be forgotten. I guess as much on the more personal side of it for me, that for me is one of the primary drivers, I think, for, for why I keep doing it. Because I, I'm young and I, I know I don't know everything about it. And in many respects, I think a lot of folks don't necessarily listen or watch for me, uh, but I'm able to talk to people that a lot of people either don't know about or would never have the opportunity to talk to. Being able to be that vehicle, uh, at least for the people that I'm able to be for, that, that really makes me feel good trying to, trying to do that for folks. Being that catalyst of preserving stories, that is a wonderful thing. And having the opportunity to capturing stories before special people in our lives leave us. That is really special. You do content marketing for a living. You understand the importance to get the message out. And what I've observed in the muzzleloading community is that there are not very many people in the community that know how to create the channels or make the experience easier to learn about events, to mm -hmm. learn about I'm seeing a shift in the few, just the past few years that, that I've been involved. And I think you've got the forward thinking of making that shift to making it easier for individuals to have access to get the interest. Mm -hmm. The technology is there, but I think that we need folks like you to share the stories to discover yeah. the community. Otherwise, like you said, the demographic is not going to be there. <laughs> yeah. And I don't begrudge anybody that, that makes and, and puts out flyers. I just see it as, you know, that's how they want to do it. And, and I'm going to do it the way that I want to do it. And we're both going to help spread the word. Exactly. And, Everybody and has it, their style. And get more people out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I try to tell folks that I'll tell you everything. I'll tell you why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm telling, I'll tell you how I'm doing it. I'll, gi I'll give you as much of a breakdown as I can if you're going to go out and share what you love about muzzleloading too. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not, I'm fortunate to, to be, you know, well-employed. I don't have to necessarily worry about the money side of this. So I'm able to, to really kind of fully enjoy it. This is really just my hobby. 
I have a small farm with some chickens and a garden during the summer, but uh, this is kind of my full time. It's not really a side gig, but I guess I just mean that by I'm not protective of it. If you're out there making videos and telling people about the things that you're doing in relation to this, I think we're all on the same team and, and getting the word out about this, uh, especially I think for, for aging communities with aging demographics, that's the big concern and you got to go where the people are at. And that's what I'm trying to do. With your day job, what got you into content marketing? So this is, <laughs> again, probably another long, I guess nothing I've done is, has been the easy, simple route. Both of my parents are, were very supportive of, of my artistic inclinations growing up, just like with, with muzzleloading, really, I guess. But as I got through high school, that's about when uh, Etsy started in, in 2010. Right around there, it really started to grow. My father's a painter and he got on Etsy and, and we, he started selling prints. He said, you know, hey, Ethan, you should, you should make one of these and, and we'll work together and maybe you can make a little money to, to buy some comic books and, and gas for your car and, and you know, kind of a, a, as a father and as parents do to, to kind of help you start taking care of yourself a little bit. So I started an Etsy shop and started selling prints of some watercolors that I'd done. And, and that was really my first exposure. I played around online really my whole life. But it was my first exposure to analytics and search engine optimization and really how to get what I was doing in front of people so that I could go buy comic books and I could buy pizza <laughs> and, I love it. Um, you know, just have a little, have a little spending money. And, and by the time I graduated, that had turned into a, a nice little, you know, kind of monthly deposit for me going into college. And I continued to work that really hard through college. I, I had some campus jobs and things, but I would still be packing and, and shipping orders on my way to and from class, dropping things off at the post office. And, and my father graciously would ship stuff to from home for me uh, while I was in college, really managed a lot of that for me uh, as far as shipping everything out. And I just kind of became enthralled with that, you know, being able to sell people that people liked what I was making enough to give me money for it was kind of a new feeling for me. And I really got into that pretty hard and, you know, trying to plan a next series of paintings based on the data that I had and understanding what trends were going on and, and how I could work with them to both create something that people would enjoy so I could pay for rent and books during college, but then also something that I still enjoyed making as an artist. And that really just continued to grow and, and still does to some capacity today, although I, I'll admit I don't work it nearly as hard as I did then. I, I think at the time I, I probably did close to four to 500 paintings uh, in a year when I was when I was really working that hard. Not all of them are great sellers, but um, there, there are quite a few paintings that, not to, to brag about it, but that when looking back, it's kind of incredible that I was able to do as much as I could off of a few paintings. So that really is what drove me really through college into getting involved with all of this. Um, coming out of college, I found myself doing freelance background painting and illustration for TV animation. I had a couple folks take a chance on me as a, as a young artist coming out of college and signed me up for some gigs that I, I completed and got some experience under my belt. And then I found myself needing to optimize my work and my website once again for a new audience being art directors and hiring managers at studios. And so that kind of spurred another avenue, I, I guess, of, of research and, and development on my end, not only to further the, the ability that I had as an artist and as an illustrator, but also as a content marketer, really, to get in front of the people that I needed to get in front of to, to pick up the next job or the next gig. It grew from there. I, I spent several years doing that and keeping up kind of the side of my art career focused on that industry. And um, a few years after that, kind of got tired and, you know, wanted kind of a change of pace. And I started working with my father again, just as, as we had when I started my Etsy shop as as he was working with his and uh, started doing a lot of content marketing for his business. Just as a, a self-employed artist, we created a YouTube channel for him and, and showcasing the work that he did in his shop. He's a very talented artist uh, in metal, glass, wood, painting, just about everything. Uh, makes Windsor chairs to hand-forged colonial American you know, hardware and uh, naturalist watercolors and wood carvings and all sorts of things. So there was a, a plethora of things for us to hang out both as a father and son, but also, you know, to film that, you know, it's kind of a lot of stuff that people don't see a lot of. And that was you know, another road for me to take. You know, that led to a, a couple more freelance clients where I, I did the same thing, both on the traditional craft 
side of things, as I call it, you know, kind of old school handmade items and, and picked up a few clients there and then shifted into uh, working for some larger companies and organizations. And, and that's where I'm at now. What was your major in college? I studied in the fine arts school at Ball State for animation. Nice. So I, I learned just about everything about animation production. And I don't do a lot of frame by frame animation anymore. I'll still, if I have an idea, I'll go through and, and make something up. But really what I enjoyed about that program was the, the fine arts side of it, really traditionally, really classically trained or set up program, really. Uh, but I had a professor there that was really great about teaching storytelling. I think that is what allowed me to elevate beyond being a, just a, simply a painter, not to knock people out there that are just painting. But I try to, ever since then, I've tried to bring a narrative element to my work. And I think looking at uh, what I'm doing now with, with I Love Muzzloading, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's something I hadn't really considered until I started <laughs> saying all this. But yeah, that was my major. I would think that your hobby business of producing your I love muzzle loading content helps in your with your day job and vice versa. It, it's all interconnected and very similar in in aspects. Yes, absolutely. I think there are two muscles that kind of that work together and when you're when you're exercising one, I think the other is resting and then you're able to do more vice versa, you know, across the different the hobby versus the business side of it, I think, yeah. Ethan, I wanted to ask you as we wrap up this interview, do you have like a favorite resource or a book that has made a difference for you either personally or professionally? There's a, there's a French comic book artist. He went by the name of Mobius. I'm not going to be able to, to say his name. He went by Mobius. You can, you can look up Mobius. Mm -hmm. He did a series of books in the early 2000s as an older man where he illustrated himself going through his mind as an older man, kind of traveling through his life. And as you read it, I think it, it comes off as kind of self-care for him, or at least is how I took it, into understanding how much the world had changed because he had been born in the, the early 1900s and saw a lot. I picked up that series and kind of, I think, a, a transitional point as I'd come out of college, I was leaving an industry and entering another one, really, between, like I've described here, kind of my work history. And reading through that and connecting that, I guess, selfishly with how I saw both my parents and my grandparents being later in life than I was at. It's not necessarily, I guess, like a how-to content market, you know, or, or how to tell a story. But it made me think about stories and in, in life differently, that I wasn't necessarily missing out on things if I changed careers, if I changed how I was thinking about something. I, I kind of saw Mobius thinking about his life in conjunction with thinking about my grandparents' life and my family's life in general. And then again, kind of connecting with muzzleloading and human history before then, how much people have gone through that things will be okay, things will work out. And I think that helped my mind be a little more flexible in how I think about things that has allowed me to, to have a lot of the experiences that I've had and do a lot of the things that I've been able to do uh, recently in life. Just talking with you, is just you're so down to earth and you have a, an appreciation for people in life. And it's just, just so delightful to talk with you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the series is called Inside Mobius. Inside if, Mobius. Uh, okay. Oh. Inside Mobius. It's a, it's a five-part series. But yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I don't want people to think that like with my channel and things that I enjoy or, or want to be you know, the focus of, of attention, I, I'm really a quiet and, and pretty shy guy. But you know, being able to, to give back a little bit and, and help out is really what, what I enjoy about it. So I, I really appreciate you inviting me on to talk about it and, and kind of geek out about it. I, re I really appreciate it. Well, I love having you and how you genuinely just share what you learn. And it really comes across on, on your channel. And I love how in just a one short year, how things have evolved. And I'm looking forward to seeing more and hopefully get to meet you in person someday. Certainly. Well, Ethan, how do, if anybody wants to follow you, what's the best way to follow you? Um, you can search for I Love Muzzleloading on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, I think those are the only platforms really that we're on. Um, all the major podcast platforms is, is where you can find the I Love Muzzleloading podcast. 
or you can just visit ilovemuzzloading.com, all one word. And that's the hub for for the, the social media, the content, the pictures, the research, and, uh, and a pretty large library of articles that we've been publishing now. And I'm just kind of spreading news and information about muzzleloading. Excellent. Well, thank you again for being here today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for being here with me today. I hope you enjoyed the episode, and let's continue the conversation. Just go over to Facebook and post what your biggest takeaway of today's show was in the Live Full Work Fun Facebook group. My biggest takeaway is the appreciation of how Ethan goes through the work of producing a fantastic YouTube channel and podcast and keeps going for the love of his hobby. I know how much work is involved in each type of production and admire how he builds his skills as a content creator and is a fantastic resource in the muzzleloading community. He made me remember how important it is to realize that you don't have to know everything about a subject to share and be a valuable resource to the community. Sharing your knowledge and experience through research on any given subject is super valuable. You'll see all his contact links down below in the show notes. Hey, I'd love for you to do me a favor. Please share this episode with just one person, one person who you might find it helpful and enjoyable. Just text a link to them. Well, thanks for listening. And until next time, have a fantastic week. Live full, work fun.